Racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. Ayn Rand, The Virtue of Selfishness. Hello again and welcome back. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his savvy squire. The end of chapter 65 contains one of the most controversial passages in all of Cervantes' writings. Don Antonio Moreno offers to intervene at the Spanish court on behalf of Ricote and Ana Felix. Ricote expresses his doubts, actually defending the expulsion of the Moriscos ordered by Philip III. The specificity of his discourse is striking. He cites the resolute nature of Don Bernardino de Velasco, Count of Salazar, the man designated to enforce the expulsion. He deploys a powerful medical metaphor that recalls the platonic notion of good political philosophy as that which preserves the health of the state. Since he sees that the entire body of our nation is rotten and contaminated, he applies a burning cautery rather than a mollifying ointment. And he compares Velasco to the 100-eyed giant of Greek mythology, his eyes of Argos, which he continuously has on alert so that none of our nation might remain behind or hide from him, like a hidden root, which in time would sprout again and bear venomous fruit in Spain, presently clean, presently unburdened by the fears to which our numbers had subjected her. Did you know, like black Africans, many Moriscos were slaves in early modern Spain? Think about the radical complexity of this passage. Cervantes has put an elaborate defense of the expulsion of the Moriscos in the mouth of Ricote, a Morisco, who paid the ransom of Don Gregorio and who shared his food and wine with his neighbor Sancho. Modern readers should recognize the dilemma of what to do about the waves of Islamic immigrants arriving in Europe and the United States. Many critics take this passage as Cervantes' acquiescence to the policy of expulsion. This might be true, but it does not make the passage any less problematic. Personally, I would argue that Ricote's liberal qualities make his speech heavily ironic. It is not inconceivable that Cervantes might be advocating for a policy of mercy, at least towards certain moriscos. At the very least, Cervantes has given us a painful social paradox. How should we act toward Islamic refugees and even domestic Islamic populations, some of whom want to kill us? Quixotic Mission. Which ethnic group represents the problem of migration in the novel through figures like Zoraida, Ricote, and Ana Felix? A. Protestants. B. Jews. C. Moriscos. Correct answer, C. Moriscos. The dilemma only gains momentum when Don Antonio states his intention to help Ricote, both as a political representative at court and as his host in Barcelona. Note that he uses the exact same phrase used by Carrasco regarding the business of helping Don Quixote. Once there, I will line up all possible efforts and may heaven bring about that which is best. Ana Felix will stay at my house with my wife or else at a monastery. And I know that the Lord Viceroy will want my good Ricote to stay at his until we see how I negotiate the business. Highlighting the anxiety of all of this, Don Gregorio refuses to accept money from Ricote, preferring instead to accept a small loan from Don Antonio, which he promises to repay at court. The final image of Don Quixote and Sancho leaving Barcelona reinforces the theme of a pacific retreat from an armed conflict. Don Quixote unarmed and dressed for travel, Sancho on foot because the gray went loaded with his arms. This echoes the symbolism of Carrasco's mule, and both of these pack animals loaded with arms echo the one we saw in chapter 24 of part two. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you can join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.